This is Adam Gorney, Rivals.com, here with the Respect My Decision podcast with former Pulaski Academy coach Kevin Kelly, former college coach, uh, famous for a lot of things, Kevin. But let's talk first about your new venture here with Kid Champion and staying involved in, in the kids' lives and staying involved in football. What do you kind of envision out of this and then just staying, you know, in the mix? You know, um, there's a lot of really cool things, the deep prop, but kind of probed into, into kid champion and what I want to do with it and, and things like that. And I was fortunate enough to be with two other guys that really feel strongly about this too. Um, but, you know, I've spent my whole life coaching high school kids and college age kids and got to uh, mingle with the pros some and things like that. And one thing I've noticed along the way is, is, you know, when kids enter sports, especially in football, but, but as an athletic director, as a high school coach, I coached other sports too. I coached some basketball and some volleyball and some track. Um, some kids had definitive advantages physically. Now you can't change that. Well, that's God given ability. And I get that, but others had uh, advantages when they came in, they had confidence. They had been in sports as a youth and had just gotten better at some of the things that make them better at different sports. Like if you played soccer, when you're four five, six and seven, you probably develop some fast twitch muscles that made you a little faster and things like that. So what kid champions going to have the opportunity for these to do kids to do is, is levelize the playing field a little bit because it's going to be a non-sport specific um, motor skills training development place. So it's guys, girls. And what we're wanting to do is a few things. One, we want to develop their confidence and plug them in to a team at the age of starting at two years old, basically up to 10 or 11 years old. And uh, to develop those skills so when they walk out to their team the first time, whether it's at four, five, and six, or whether it's in seventh grade, that they're used to taking coaching. They're used to being asked to perform athletic uh, uh, things and understanding what a coach wants from them, and they'll already have developed some of those skills. So, you know, I was a guy that when I was in seventh grade, you know, I physically wasn't developed as a people. And I wish that I had understood and been around coaching and had developed some motor skills a little bit earlier. I ended up having, you know, okay career um, that route. But but I think it's an opportunity to do that for a lot of kids. And at the same time, give them confidence, get them plugged into a group of kids early and uh, and just understand the dynamics of what social relationships around athletics can mean. For those that don't know, Kid Champion is an athletic development center in Arkansas, and Kevin's going to be, you know, really spearheading this effort. And for for Arkansas athletes especially, I live in California, so everyone gets trained by elite trainers at every position and those kinds of things. And that happens across the southeast in Florida and, and the northeast as well. But in that part of the country, how important is it to, to kind of get that advantage early Um to start that athletic process that that you're talking about? I think you hit the nail right on the head. You know, other places and and, and, and all over the country, they're getting that early in life. And, and, you know, you hear war stories about some of that. You know, you're burning kids out, this, that, and the other. What we want to do is is develop a fine line. We want to train kids. I think the non-sport specific thing will help. Uh, not kids not get burned out on a certain sport early. And you hear it all the time that kids need to be involved in as many sports as they want to. So, so by doing it in a non, in a non-specific sport area, I think that also encourages kids to play multiple sports, enjoy it, have fun, take coaching from different people, find out what your true passion is. I think all those things are important to do. And then you and I both know, and you deal with this on a day-to-day basis when you know, it's competitive to get into college. And I'm not talking, everybody doesn't have to be a D1 athlete in all sports, but to get in at all, it is so competitive. And, and if you want the better chance and, and, and this doesn't even have to be the reason to come to kid champion, but if you want the better chance, you better be putting in time earlier because God knows the people that you're competing against are certainly doing those things. I'd like your opinion on these because you do definitely have some orthodox opinions on sports and football, but the, the feeling is now that specializing, um, especially for football players is a bad idea. Uh, you should play multiple sports. You should run track. You should wrestle. Maybe if you're a lineman playing basketball is great. Just any, you know, diversifying your athletic ability is a good idea. Do you kind of subscribe to that idea or do you think, Football is a specialization sport. You know, what's funny, early in my career, 
you know, I was around some coaches that that wanted the kids to specialize. And, and it makes sense. They want to coach them and have them, you know, 365 days a year. They think that'll be better. That'll help their careers and things like that. But, you know, when I became the athletic director in 2006 at Pulaski Academy, where I was, you know, then I really started seeing the need for um, those kids to not specialize, to be involved in other sports. Because I started, you know, as I was watching and around different coaches, I would, th- I would think as a football coach, you know, after I got to know the other coaches and watch their practice, I was like, you know, he could learn, my guy could learn some things. My kid could learn some things from being around that coach, from being coached by somebody different. And uh, so I started appreciating it a little bit more. And then I started remembering back when I was in high school and I wanted to play multiple sports, you know, that, that, that you know, if I'd had a coach pushing me to play one sport, I wouldn't have appreciated that. And I would have missed out on some great opportunities and relationships and, and different things like that. Not to mention, I mean, who wouldn't get tired of me being coached 365 days a year by the same guy? You know, I mean, there's some of that, that burnout too. So sometimes it comes from the kids. Sometimes the coaches themselves at high schools are, are really pushing a kid to play one sport. And so, you know, probably 2007, 2008, I started pushing our coaches to not do that. If I heard about it, I'd sit down and have a talk with them. We're not going to do it that way. You know, let these kids play whatever they want to play. And and really, our school kind of took off athletically after that. And and I'm proud of that. So, no, I, I, I'm a firm believer that kids should play multiple sports. For the people watching this, um, you know, Kevin Kelly is definitely a name that's well known and has been on multiple television shows about this and Pulaski Academy as well. Uh, this is the guy that that rarely punted. And I say rarely like a few times over <laughs> a very long career. And it's really based and it's interesting. And, and this is kind of where I want the, the conversation to go. It, it's based on analytics. Um, this isn't just something that you want to be a quirky football coach. This is something that has been studied by people, I believe at Harvard, maybe Cal has a study about it too, that um, the risk of going for it is far greater than 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 punting. The, the risk is actually in punting the football and, and giving it to the other team. Can you kind of describe how this evolved in, in your thinking and how you've adopted it as, as being a football coach? You know, it, it's really quite a long story, but I, I was abruptly given the head coaching job here. Uh, or at, at Pulaski Academy, and, and when I, uh, uh, I I I was I walked in like I say abruptly. I didn't know it was coming. The other guy, you, you left, and 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 it, instead of opening up, they just hired me. So I was called in. And they said, "Hey, we're making you the head coach." The other guy's leaving. I'm like, "What? I, what just happened?" You know, and I was excited, but I'm thinking, "All right." Well, I go back and sit in my office, and I'm like, "Wait a minute, our kids didn't change any. Nothing changed. I thought the last guy was a pretty good coach, but we could never make it very far." You know, and so I just said, I just took our coaching staff and said, we're going to ask, start asking why. Why aren't we doing all the things we're doing in football in January, in our off season, all the way through uh, December? And when I got to the on the field stuff, I asked, why, why were we punting? And of course, the instant answer is, you know, well, you know, field position, you know, it's a field position game. So whenever we came up with any answers and like that, because I was asking those questions about everything we were doing and I studied those too, I wanted to know why. So I started running some of my own numbers and I'd found something. This was pre moneyball mind you. Uh, so I started running some of my, uh, trying to formulate some of my own numbers. And then I found a, a, a guy that had put some numbers together and shown that you should punt a lot less. And so you know, that's one of the things I started looking at and adopting. And along the way, I picked up onside uh, onside kicks. You know, you have to weigh how much does it mean to you to get the ball as opposed to how much does it mean to you to give up those yards of field position, all those kinds of things. And uh, then I started adding it. I, I got really, you know, success stories. And, and I consider myself a, a, luck, a lucky success story. I was in the right place at the right time a lot of time. But if you look at – you know, success stories. I think uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote in Outliers. He talked about Bill Gates and some of the places he was in to be successful. I got really lucky in 2009 and the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference at MIT, they called and Daryl Morey called, who's now the GM of the Sixers and, and had me up there to speak. And I got to really dive into the world of analytics and what that meant in other sports and football. And then I went back in 2014 and 2014 was a paradigm shift because I said, you know, forget just the field position part of analytics, but the way you call plays, the way you design things. I decided to find out what the five most important things were in winning football games and and apply those to our team. So, 
you know, and, and, and some of that was 20 yard plays. Those were the most telling stat to, to determine who won a football game. Turnovers were too, but everybody works on turnovers. So I'm not going to really get any better. You know, I mean, we're going to run, have guys run through the line and slap the ball. I mean, everybody's doing that. So I'm not going to get any better at that, but Onside kicks are kind of creating a turnover. It's not counted as that, but it's creating a turnover. So you add that in. Um, 20 yard plays, um, quarterback sacks at, at that time. Well, two years ago, two and a half, three years ago, whatever it was, in college football, 77% of all games were won by who had the most quarterback sacks. Hmm. And so that was the third most telling uh, stat in football. So we started designing better blitz schemes focusing on that and, and working on how to get more quarterback sacks because a quarterback set. And, and then I applied it to us and I looked over our drives for the past five years, we were scoring touchdowns at an 88% rate. If we didn't have a sack or a penalty on a drive. Now that's insane. 88% is insane. Yeah. Yeah. But when we got sacked, it went down to 8%, eight percent eight from 88. So that tells you. So anyway, to make a long story short, I wanted to be consistently good at the top all the time, not just rise and flow. If you had talent or if you had a good run, got lucky a couple of times and a couple of tip balls went your way. And the way to do that is find out what wins games the most and orchestrate your entire philosophy around that. And we did that because of analytics and had a good run. How did you, as a coach, when you're standing on the sidelines, how did you balance just the gut feeling of of quote unquote momentum. Now, some sports scientists don't even believe momentum exists in sports. They 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 argue that it's not really a thing and it's it's sort of a creation of your own mind. But how did you balance gut feeling on fourth down, let's say fourth and nine from the 26 or whatever, versus just saying, I'm sticking to the book, I'm taking the, I'm playing the percentages, and I'm gonna do this. Well, and and first of all, you know. The scientists, the people you're talking about that that say that, you know, the gut feeling, uh, you know, that people use gut feelings too much and momentum doesn't exist. You know, they're right a lot and coaches are right a lot. I mean, there's some of both. They're, right. You know, I'm a, I'm, I, I believe I'm a numbers guy first, but I, those guys need to go down on the sideline and feel what momentum is. Sure. They don't they don't admit it because they can't calculate it. There's not a constant you can assign to a mathematical equation for momentum. There's not one, but, but, but to get past it, what guys that are numbers guys have to do. And I've sat down with a few of them and tried to explain it. And they're, they get on the cusp of going, okay, I understand, but we can't assign a value to put in our equation. But, you know, if you've got momentum and everything's going right. Okay. Here's the, I, I, I work with quarterbacks more than anything. So I can, I can kind of uh, uh, put it in quarterbacks terms. If you go out there and you go zip, 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 zip down the field and your team scores a touchdown, and you you come back out in the next series, you're going to have confidence. Everybody would agree you would have a little more confidence than if three drives in a row you've thrown interceptions. Well, if you've got confidence, what does that mean? That means you're going to make your read, study your keys, and you're not going to hesitate before you throw that ball. Well, the not hesitating keeps that window open. If you hesitate 0.25 seconds, that window you have in the NFL and college and high school might be closed completely. And now you're throwing the ball and it gets knocked down, picked off. Your guy, get your receiver gets hammered because the safety's coming across. So momentum, you know, you can't assign a value to it. But I can tell you this, it happens because something good happens. You get confidence. You don't hesitate. You trust your keys. And then it starts happening really well and really fast. That's what momentum is, but nobody can sign a value. So momentum is very real. I mean, you and I both know that. If you've watched the games, you understand what momentum sure. is. But there really is science behind it. It's it's the it's the brain and it's 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 the time and it's those kinds of things. So to to go a little bit further forward, when you are going down that path and you're sitting there and you're on the sidelines, and don't get me wrong, I I I, I should have punted some when we did a punt. But the numbers that I used personally would show that if you decide you're not going to punt, you also have to work on it less in practice. And how valuable yeah. is that practice time every day? So I balance that into the equation that nobody else is thinking. They're just thinking on the field numbers and field position. So that said, what you have to do or what I did was make decisions before you get into the game. Because if you get into the game, you will feel those emotions. And you will listen to the crowd booing or yay or yelling, you're an idiot coach, go uh, put the ball or whatever, you know, 
And, 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 and that does get to you because people are emotional and, and your, your emotions, honestly, I, I it's, it don't make, I've got several studies that I fall back on that show you sh humans shouldn't make decisions based on emotions. It affects our performance level. So, so you make the decisions before you get into the game. And, you know, I think our game's changed a lot. If you look even at the NFL level, you know, look at the way people are going for two and they're, and they're punting less and all those things. And people give the Chargers head coach the, uh, a hard time last year. But if you'll look, you know, he made those decisions before he went in a game, what he was going to do in each situation. Sometimes, and they're not always going to pan out. All you're looking for is a 1% edge at that moment because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to go. But if you've got a pick em game, you know, whether it's college, pro, high school, or whatever. And really, every, you know, if the numbers go, God, this is a 50-50 shot to who would win. And if I make or he makes eight decisions that are right by not punting or taking a certain penalty in a certain spot, and the other guy makes eight wrong ones, just eight, one percentage. Now, that's a 16% difference. You went from a 50-50 team to a 64 to 36 chance to win. Or, so, yeah, yeah, uh, 52, yeah, 64 to 36% chance to win by not getting any better on the field, not coaching better, not playing better, not anything. You got better and had a better chance to win that game. That's a big difference between 50-50 by making the decision before you ever start the game. You've talked about this before, and it's interesting. Um, why NFL teams and more college teams haven't adopted this? And, and, the, and the theory is that – Coaches have to answer to athletic directors and athletic directors have to answer to alumni. So if it's fourth and three from the 50 and they don't get it, someone has to answer to that. And, and owners want to see that. So when you see like fourth and one at midfield and the NFL team punts, you think that's really just that's just dumb football. That's not playing not not only not playing to win, but playing the, the odds that you're going to win that game. Right. Yeah, there's no question. I've talked to a ton of coaches at, at, at all levels. And they have to worry about keeping their job, and they worry about that. And I don't, I don't blame them for it. There's obviously a lot of money, and that's your livelihood. But you're worried about your assistants too. The head coaches will be okay; they make tons of money. But somebody's going to come in and fire all your assistants, yeah. and they worry about them too. But yes, priority number one is keep your job. Priority number two is winning. And anybody that tells you any different, uh, and I won't say anybody, but ninety percent of the people that tell you any different are not telling the truth. And I do think that those guys convince themselves that, well, you know, really big picture here. We're a good defense. We should punt the ball, even though if they've ever been explained and looked at the numbers, they do know. But, yeah, they're 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 thinking keep job first and win second. And, you know, the irony is with the way that the game goes, you know, there's probably a lot of substance behind what they're doing because, because a lot, you know, people may fire you now on a Monday after the after the weekend, you know, and and for sure, if anything goes wrong during the year, everybody points out dumb decisions you made, dumb decisions you made on the field, and they use that to 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 get get rid of you. And and so, but the irony is, those decisions had you made the proper ones would have helped you win more games in the big picture and keep your job. But you've got to get an owner or an athletic director that understands big picture uh, for you to be able to do those things. And, and that takes us back. And this is the last thing, and this has been an interesting conversation. I wish I could go on for a lot longer, but it does take me back to like the money ball of, of football idea that it, you know, in Moneyball, uh Billy Bean met, met that resistance um, from his own um, scouts to his own manager to a lot of the players that didn't buy in until it started working. And, and like you said, these, these programs that year after year are eight and six or six and eight and continue to do the same things. Is it really just the reluctance to adopt this idea that, Hey, this might work. The, these changes might work. And then, and then implementing them to see that, that statistically over time, they will be successful. Yeah, that that's it, a hundred percent. You're exactly right. I, I think a lot of guys would like to implement more of this and and take some of the tough decisions off of them. You know, yeah. some guys like to take make those decisions. A lot of guys don't want to make those decisions, and they would like to change. But but people don't give it time. Your own players start to question. As a coach, you never want your players to start questioning, and so that, that it's a fight. And uh, you know, 
you, you either you have to be a good leader. We have to get guys to buy in when and because people have changed in the old days. What a coach said went and everybody just did it. Nowadays, everybody questions why even their own players. And I'm talking even at the junior high level, at the NFL level, you know, guys are guys are questioning. And and as long as that's the case, you know, then then I think analytics are going to be sequestered they're going to be slowed down because of that you know because even if the owner backed you 100 percent, a coaching is going to make a coach isn't going to take a chance on losing his team unless he's a guy that like a nick saban you know like a bill belichick that that knows no matter what he's going to be fine yeah that is former pulaski academy coach kevin kelly uh Anybody in the Little Rock, Arkansas area, look up Kid Champion, get get involved, and it's a great, great service. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Adam. Appreciate it.